Good evening, good afternoon, and a very early good morning to those who may have joined us today from outside of Asia. Welcome to this very special webinar of Art Journalism Network on One Health. I'm Stella Paul, Environment and Health Project Officer at EJN or Arts Journalism Network, and I'm your moderator for the day. Today, we are looking at, uh, we are connecting the dots between climate change, biodiversity loss, and how they impact our health. And to discuss this, we have a brilliant lineup of speakers with us today. And it's my pleasure to introduce them to you shortly. Before that, a couple of housekeeping uh, rules for you. So if you are uh, joining us today with questions, uh, I do welcome you to type your questions. Uh, please use the Q&A button to type your questions. Uh, please do not uh, write your questions on the chat box because we will be only screening the Q&A section from time to time. We'll also make sure that most of your questions are answered, however, Today's session is for one hour. And in case we run out of time and your questions were not answered fully, we will be sharing uh, the contact details of our esteemed speakers and you can connect with them you know, later after the, the session of you know, this webinar. Uh, for journalists, especially if you are planning to write any stories after this session, and if you do have further questions or if you want to clarify any point that our speakers raised here today, please, please do connect with them just to make sure that all the information that you get is factually correct. And with that, let me now introduce you uh, to the speakers here. Uh, first, on the left of my screen, I see Serge Moran. Serge Moran is a senior ecologist. He's associated with, and here I apologize for my French, so I'm just going to <laughs> translate this into English. And it is the National Center for Scientific Research. Serge, I hope I got it correct. Uh, Serge is also affiliated with a number of other One Health uh, related bodies, including the quadrupedite, which you may have heard is a One Health uh, scientific uh, body that brings in four UN agencies, the FAO, WHO, UNEP, and, uh, UNEP, and then uh, WHAP. Um, Sorry, did I get it wrong again? It's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, so uh, yeah, the world body for animal health. Um, and Serge, uh, would you like to just say a quick hello to our, our audience today? Yes, uh, so I'm very pleased and thank you Stella for this introduction. I'm very pleased to be uh, uh, with this panel today. So I want to discuss about uh, these important uh, on Earth perspectives. Thank you. Thank you, Serge. We are extremely happy to have you today and uh, attendees. Uh, this is the person who is actually going to connect all those dots that we have mentioned earlier in our registration page and the ones that I have just mentioned. So do stay tuned, you know. Uh, and it, now let me take you to introduce you to Ruklanti or Ruki. Uh, Ruklanti de Alvis is a senior, again, a senior scientist. Uh, she is the deputy director of the Center for, uh, Center, oh, I don't want to get it wrong here. So yes, a deputy director of the Center for Outbreak Preparedness or COP. And she's also an assistant professor at the Emerging Infectious Disease Program at Duke. Uh, NUS Medical School in Singapore, um, Ruklanti or Ruki, uh, welcome. A very, very warm welcome to you. Thank you. Happy to be here. Thank you. And last but not least, we have one of our own here, and that is uh, Siu Linong. She is a senior journalist with over 30 years of uh, report experience of reporting environment and 
uh, One Health Issues as well. She is also the founder of Mekaranga. Uh, Mekaranga is an independent media outlet that is focusing on climate and other environmental issues. Siulin, welcome. Thanks very much. Yeah, very happy to be here. Hello from Kuala Lumpur. So uh, just to give you uh, an idea, we just came out of COP27. Many of us uh, were probably there. In, you know, some of you may have been there as well. Many of you have been closely following what happened and probably may have seen that not a lot have happened or uh, there have been some actions that have been taken, uh, but we still are waiting for those little developments that always don't meet the eyes. And those who have been you know, covering health uh, usually keep wondering, I myself keep wondering, you know, how does the outcome or how does do the decisions that were taken at COP27 will or are going to you know, impact the health on this planet? With that thought, we are also very soon heading to Montreal where the UN Biodiversity COP15 is going to happen. So definitely, you know, we often uh, hear the CBD um, experts telling us that climate change or COP27 and biodiversity are integral, you know, integrally uh, linked. And if nothing happens at COP27, uh, not much is going to happen in COP15. So the question is, what did happen in COP27? And how is that leading us to COP15? COP especially the decisions, the, the outcomes of COP15. How are they linked and how are they, again, how are they all going to impact the health? Uh, we are just coming out of a pandemic. It's not over yet. That's what scientists keep telling us. And we are already, you know, world over, there is a preparation. Uh, experts are preparing for probably the next pandemic. So standing at this intersection, uh, we have so many questions, especially the journalists among you who are covering One Health issues. You keep probably wondering, okay, how do we look at this? How do we look at that? You know, not in an isolated ways, but how do we take a holistic look? And you know, how do we build our understanding of the One Health approach and the importance of it? So coming from there, we have our panelists today who are going to, you know, talk more about that, lead us to, you know, through through this entire discussion, and then of course take the questions from you. And now with that, it's my pleasure to invite our first panelist, Serge Moran. So Serge, you are a man of many hats, <laughs> but they are all linked to One Health. So you are our you know, One Health expert here. With that, let me again ask you the same question. You know, how will the outcome of COP27 and the decisions at you know, the Biodiversity COP, how are they going to impact the health on this planet? This is a, a very, thank you very much, Stella. And this is a, a, a very also a challenging, a challenging point. And uh, actually I was, uh, Invited in in one. Oops, sorry, I I must miss the the screening sharing. Okay. Okay, should be good now. Yeah. So and I was uh, I was starting to 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 discuss at this uh, at this COP twenty seven, especially in a in a special session, which was a. Uh, uh, food for climate. So it was really important and it was one of the aspects because food for planet actually discussed at the COP27 the link between One Health, all the food system, and of course related to, to, to biodiversity. And uh, I would just start with some fact, some way that we, we may think about. We are facing an epidemic of epidemics. If we are looking at the data, and uh, this I show you the data I gathered for the humans, the livestock, or even the wildlife, you see that over the last decades, we have an increasing number of outbreaks of zoonotic disease, of vector-borne diseases that are affecting humans. 
increasing number of outbreaks of, of uh, disease that affect livestock and poultry, and even increasing number of outbreaks uh, affecting uh, the wildlife. The drivers are complex. It's including also climate change and climate, uh, I would say, cl extreme events. But I will, I will leave it for the for the other speakers because they are really much more focusing on this. We are going to some other driver, and especially two drivers. The one driver is livestock. And the livestock is also increasing a lot over the last decade. Now, the total number of cattle on Earth is more than 1 billion 600 million. Number of chickens, close to 40 billion. Number of, of pigs, close to 1.5 billion, and actually a little decrease because of the uh, pandemics that also affecting the, the, the pig production. So now the hearse is not only dominated by humans, it's dominated by livestock and poultry. The biomass of cattle on Earth is higher as the total biomass of human being. The total number of wildlife, of wild birds, decreased from 300 billion in 1997 to 50 billion in 2020. Why the chicken raised? 40 billion. So now there will be more chicken on the planet than the old uh, uh, wild birds. These are a huge impact, of course, related to climate change, to really the impact of our thing, but also really impact on biodiversity, on disease. And it's also two facts when you're looking at the data. If you're looking at the number of disease known by countries on, or, or regarding to biodiversity, of course, we, found, we see that at the higher level, there's a good relationship between the number of known infectious and parasitological disease in the country related to species richness. It's normal. Infectious diseases are done by microbes, by virus, by parasites. It's biodiversity equal biodiversity. But if I'm looking at the biodiversity at traits, and you see Southeast Asia is one of the hotspots, but not only, we're using that the increasing number of outbreaks of disease. So unregulation is really related to the number of species at treat. The higher the species we lost, the higher the chance to increase the number of outbreaks. Something is going wrong in terms of the ecosystem and any outbreaks means that we have some things to be aware of. So that's why we are working a lot on this one health on this approach of the one health. Now, thanks to the quadripartite and thanks to the work we are doing to the, with my colleagues on the, on the OLEP, the One Health High Level Expert Panel, we have a new definition of the One Health, more integrated, so sustainably balanced the health of people, animals, and ecosystem, recognizing all these interlinkages between all non-human and, and, uh, and human living, on the need to mobilize sectors, deep disciplines, and communities, and of course to tackle all the problems to health, but also for humans, for animals, for the ecosystem. Really to have this vision that all is linked. And now, thanks to the quadripartite, we have now a, a joint a plan of action to implement the one else uh, at the level of the country. So this you you can have a, a little bit more. You, you can see the joint action plan. But now I will finish my presentation with what we need. We need solutions. So we, we now are starting to have a good vision what's going wrong, something is going wrong. We have to go back to the, to the solution. So I will present two solutions, two also supported by the international organization. A new one that has been launched just before the COP27, but now we will have the results in the COP15 is this new uh, project, this new international project, Nature for Health, really preventing pandemics, but really at the source, really at the source of the ecosystem, really to be have a better inter inter understanding of the links between nature, climate change and health on all the other sectors in, in order to help the country to operationalize, to enable, to strengthen action and to sustain and to show 
sewage solution at the source. And the last one, uh, I would like to say that I'm very proud also to be also part of this. With UNESCO, we are starting also, and it will be launched at the COP15 and just after a new massive course online to how to succeed one health through religion territories, but especially using the biosphere reserves of UNESCO as a platform and a platform to implement solution, solution to avoid to go to the wrong path, but to go to the future we want. But we need to get the vision and we need to explore the best practices and we need to have new tools in hand. And I will like to thank you for, uh, for this moment. <laughs> Thank you, Serge. Thank you. That is really impressive to hear that, you know, uh, we often see that journalists who have been reporting on uh, the climate change, on health and challenges, and the biodiversity loss, then get very close to giving it up because they are frustrated because solution journalism, um, you know, a solution, they're looking for solution stories, but they just don't know where to look for them. Exactly. So thank you very much for showing us so, some light here at the end of the dark tunnel, I would say. And I'm sure those who are, who just listen to you will uh, go back today with some, at least some uh, solution story ideas. Uh, with that, um, let me now uh, go to uh, our second uh, panelist of the day, uh, Ruki. So Ruki, we just uh, heard from Serge, you know, how the biodiversity loss is so closely linked to the rise of infectious diseases as well. Um, now, we also have seen the same in climate change. For example, we have seen, uh, you know, dengue outbreaks even in places right. you know that w w that didn't have those outbreaks before uh, because of the erratic rain patterns and climate change um, so could you tell us how climate change is also you know can trigger uh, the you know the spread or um, outbreak more outbreaks of more infectious diseases and maybe you know keeping in the line of solutions because we are so actively looking for them could you also tell us what are the ways uh to prevent these or to control this over to you Ruki. thank you stella um going after uh, serger's presentation which was actually really very comprehensive and you know i'm sort of narrowing into a very small area uh where climate change is affecting infectious disease outbreaks and the control efforts and you're absolutely correct dengue is one of those examples that you can easily see a link between climate change and the spread of uh, in, uh, dengue virus where it's happening. And I will go into it a little bit detail as we move on. Um, so if we, there was a recent study where they looked at the entire world and where the risk of infectious disease outbreaks are in the world. And, you know, there is obviously we've heard of these hotspots in the Asian region and you can see some hotspots in Europe as well. So areas where the population is very concentrated. But you see, this model had a lot of other factors that went into it. And as you can see here, so the paper is right here for whoever wants to uh, find this publication. And you can see here when they did their modeling of this risk factor, outbreak risk across the world, right? They've taken quite a lot of factors into consideration. And they're not just human factors, they're also animal factors and environmental. So infectious disease outbreaks are clearly a one health issue, right? Um, and we, you know, this was also highlighted in the World One Health Congress that a lot of, maybe some of you are attending it and some of my colleagues were organizing it as well. So as we can see, there is a complex interaction between um, the environment, humans, animals, and infectious pathogens. Now, we can 
you know, climate change leads to a lot of hazards that we've heard happening, right? So there's global warming, there's a lot of precipitation, floods, some regions have droughts, there's storms, so there's erratic weather patterns. And, you know, there's a recent study that was done literally this year that came out in Nature Climate Change. And what these, uh, these scientists are doing is they're really trying to model the interaction between climate hazards, so climate change patterns and infectious diseases. Diseases. And as you can see here, you can find all the uh, climate change hazards here and how those are affecting transmission. So the different ways in, in ways that infectious diseases are transmitted, right? So you can see there are viruses and, that are transmitted by vectors such as mosquitoes or ticks, uh, et cetera. Or, and then there are ones that are waterborne diseases, right? So your, your enterics, your diarrheal diseases, typhoid, so on. There are definitely the airborne diseases, so COVID, so SARS-CoV-2 is one of them, influenza, and then direct contact, food, and obviously there's a bunch of others they call unspecified. And as you can see here, every single one of these transmission factors are affected by uh, climate change, which leads to directly affecting infectious diseases. So just, um, this is a very heavy slide uh, image. And one of the things that I want to show you is this interactive website. So those journalists in the audience definitely go into this website and I'm going to stop this PowerPoint slide and actually show demonstrate this website where, you know, these are scientists, uh, ecologists, scientists, virologists, they're really trying to uh, make an interactive dashboard where you see the climate hazards, how that in, uh, interacts with infectious disease. So what you can see here, so just as the figure earlier showed, there's the climate hazard, that's the transmission type, and there's the infectious disease here listed on the right. Here, Interestingly, so we keep talking about the negative impacts, right? So they've listed negative and positive. So if you go, if you list as positive, so those are the climate changes that leads to some sort of positive effect, right, on infectious disease. So there are some positive effects. However, if you filter by negative effects, do you see all the list goes on and on and on and on? So really, climate change, all these effects are leading to a much larger negative impact on infectious disease and increase in outbreaks. Look at all those. So journalists in the audience, when you have time, really go through this, uh, sort of play around with it. It's a very interesting interactive tool. Um, so just back to the presentation. Okay. But, you know, looking at this complex sort of ecosystem, this is very abstract, right? Sometimes we need to dig into like actual examples. And like Stella mentioned, dengue is one of those examples. And I've done a lot of research on dengue. So for me, it's very easy um, to relate to. Again, it's a disease that leads to fever, but also a very broad spectrum. People do die from this. Um, estimated over about 100 million cases a year across the world. Um, apologies. Okay. Um, it's spread by a mosquito vector, so what's known as Aedes aegypti, Aedes albopictus. Um, and here is a map of the spread. So there's a huge burden of, of dengue disease in the tropical regions, as you can see, in the warm regions, and also in, in populated regions. Now, what's interesting is that mosquitoes have been predicted to, to increase in territory. So this is a, a study that was done a couple of years ago. And what they looked at was as, as greenhouse gases increase, what happens to the spread or basically and global warming increase, what happens to the geographical spread of mosquitoes, right? The mosquito vectors that are spreading dengue. And you can see there's an increase in the geographical spread. What, what that study, again, the, the citations here, you can go refer to it. What they also uh, predicted was that there's not only an increase in the geographical territory of these mosquitoes, and hence probably a huge effect on the dengue numbers, but there is also, it lengthens the time of when dengue um, transmission is active. 
So again, adding to the case numbers. So that's a very direct sort of example. Now, you know, we what are the strategies to contain these outbreaks, right? And, you know, I've broken this down into mitigation and adaptation. So definitely as we talk about efforts to mitigate the effects of climate change, right? I mean, there's, I won't get into it because there are numerous efforts that are being discussed uh, to reduce greenhouse gases. From the outbreak, uh, preparedness side of things, we are looking at ways to sort of adaptation methods. So, so make sure that we are prepared when an outbreak does happen. And one of the major ones that we're doing is really enhancing pathogen surveillance systems, making sure that when that outbreak happens, whether it's from an animal jump to a human, whether it's vector borne, whether it's direct respiratory, we actually capture it. Apologies. And you know, also coming up with better and faster diagnostics to really capture that as well. And here's just, this is some of the efforts that our group and our network in the region are doing. It's known as the Asia Pathogen Genomics Initiative. Uh, but there are, again, these are a network of 13 countries that we're working with national public health laboratories, really trying to strengthen, um, you know, surveillance in these countries so that when the next outbreak comes, we can really capture it soon and really act. But again, there are other networks in the world as well, not just this one that we, uh, we are involved in. Then there's strengthening health systems. So a lot of work is going into strengthening health systems so that when an outbreak does come, our hospital systems are strong and can tackle the influx of patients. Now, new research is needed at the intersection of climate change and infectious diseases. And that's something, that's a direction that we, as, as a world, there needs to be new funding that goes into it. Again, these are very complex studies. However, these need to be done to really assess the true impact of climate change on infectious disease outbreaks. And obviously not the last one, but one of the last ones that I've listed is we need to work on vaccines and therapeutics, really rapid technologies that are broadly protective so that, you know, maybe we can be we can target against families of viruses or families of bacteria and really be prepared when the next outbreak comes. Again, if I had to leave a takeaway message, it's just, it's that infectious diseases are intricately linked to climate change. Um, and as we mitigate climate change, we must also implement adaptation strategies where we can tackle current and future outbreaks so that the countries are ready so I leave you with that. Thank you, Ruki. That was really so interesting. I almost forgot <laughs> where I'm sitting, you know, on a virtual platform. Um, and you did uh, have one takeaway message, but I could at least as you were talking, I could think of at least three to four stories that could come out of that. For example, you just said, you know, the pathogen surveillance system. I don't think, uh, you know, as journalists, we do report a lot on the surveillance system or the country's capacities to build these surveillance systems and how they could actually help us in another factor that you just mentioned in being prepared for the next you know, disease outbreak or the next pandemic. Um, so that would probably be one of the, you know, one of the uh, sectors of, you know, fact that some of this, uh, the, what today's attendees would like to look at. Uh, before okay. I, thank, so thank you very much. No and worries. Before no we, worries. Yeah. we go to our, our uh, final panelists today, I would again, uh, uh, you know, remind everybody and appeal to everybody to, to uh, you know, post your questions. We do have some good questions here, and I will make sure that these are answered by our experts today. Uh, but do do post your questions, you know, uh, whether they are linked to, you know, climate change or biodiversity loss. You know, uh, if you are curious about anything that is associated with One Health, you do have this panel here to, to give you the answers. Um, and with that, uh, let me now come to you, uh, Siulin. Um, so Siulin, you have been uh, reporting on environment and health and the linkages between uh, the both, you know, for, for over two decades now. Um, you have, I remember reading your story specifically on 
pig farming and how they are, you know, posing health risks to people, you know, a large section of population in, you know, across Malaysia. So those were great stories. I do wonder, you know, if you, you know, how, how where, where are we doing it right and where are we missing the stories? So that's a question many journalists do think, you know, okay, One Health stories are good. You know, it's a new concept, of course. So how do I find stories and how do I highlight the linkages between the two, um, you know, environment and, and health? And finally, how do I do it safely, you know, without endangering myself while trying to tell a story? So, Siulin, please take it from here, and if you could touch up tips for us as well. Absolutely, yeah. Thanks very much, Stella. Um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's amazing to be to be following up from two really really good experts. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen now. Um, okay. Okay. So we've got my notes on here, yeah? Let me just do this. Give me a minute. Okay, I think I might need um, Amy to help out, please. Amy, if you don't mind. Uh, sure. Okay, sure, I'll do it. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's really um, amazing to be following up uh, from from two experts, and I think that's one one thing as journalists that we really really uh, value. It's people who really know what they're talking about, and uh, to really um, pull pull upon their ideas, you know, to sort of take from their ideas. Um, and I am now going to go into how do we report on connecting the dots, right? Um, and basically, um, Amy next. What's happening now, I think, is very interesting, and it is why are we reporting on uh, climate change? Uh, why are we reporting on One Health? And it is because of COVID, basically. Uh, next, uh, Amy, that you have this uh, diagram. Remember this from COVID? It kind of went viral. Yep. Uh, and so basically, I think at this time, readers have never been more interested in the causes, impacts, and solutions related to health. Next. So we're coming back again to this diagram where we're looking at uh, what One Health is. What we want to do is to look at the intersections of human health, animal health, and environmental health. Now, how do we as journalists uh, look at these intersections? How do we tell stories? How do we tell the stories that, uh, you know, from the, the gold nuggets of experts like the previous two speakers that make our readers sort of get into it and understand that these really are nuggets and these are things that are important to our lives and, you know, should we change our behaviours and should we change the way that we live lives and create policies and all the rest of it, yeah? So next... Uh, basically, uh, WHO has uh, come up with a few sort of story ideas. What are the intersections we should be looking at? Uh, so the first one would be food and water safety. Um, then we need to be looking at nutrition. And then, of course, we need to be uh, looking at the control of zoonosis, which are diseases that are spread between animals and humans. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's the one that a lot of journalists are like, oh, yeah, that's the one that I really want to get into because I want to be the one to sort of, uh, you know, sort of like um, discover the next COVID, if you like, right? But there are all these other aspects that you have to look at as well. Uh, and then the next thing would be uh, looking at pollution, right? Pollution management. How does um, climate change and, uh, you know, how does biodiversity loss um, relate to pollution and to human health and to environmental health and to animal health, yeah? And uh, finally, the other sort of area that we should be looking at would be combating antimicrobial resistance, right? The emergence of microbes that are resistant to um, antibiotics, right? So these are some of the key areas that we as journalists can be looking at, right? Uh, next. Now, where do we get story ideas from? Now, um, luckily, Earth Journalism Network has lots and lots of resources. And I want to zoom in on this one particular um, project that was done recently. And it was basically looking at how do we tackle 
uh, the increase in meat consumption in Asia Pacific. So it was a multi newsroom um, effort with uh, about 12 journalists, I believe, and looking at different countries and looking at different aspects. So if you want to find ideas as to how do you tackle uh, one aspect, for example, meat consumption, we heard from Serge as, as to the number of um, uh, animals that, are in, that have increased and in populating the, the, the earth, you know. So I would strongly recommend that you go into this fantastic, beautifully laid out website and look at the ways that different journalists from across countries uh, sort of um, tackle the issue, yeah? Um, and next, uh, basically what we want to do really is one of the most effective ways of getting messages across is visually. So we saw, for example, Serge's wonderful um, GIF uh, slides, you know, and, and, and that's very attractive, but it also saves you a lot of words and it also gets the message across very, very strongly. So this is one way of doing it. Um, you know, this is from my story, actually, how do pig farms pollute? And what, what you do is you use a diagram to show, uh, you know, cause and effect. So where does it come from? Uh, where does it go? Who does it impact? Yeah, next. Moving on, this is another uh, beautiful diagram which was done by an Indian journalist who was part of the project. Uh, as you can see, there's chickens there, the chickens that Serge talked about, yeah, and how it impacts with one glance. And it's a very attractive design. You can see how it impacts human health. But at the bottom, what the dogs doing there? And actually, one aspect of the story really covered how um, basically uh, farmers actually what they were doing with um, how they were disposing of chickens that had died. They were just throwing them into the countryside. As they threw them in the countryside, dogs started eating them and the number of dogs started growing. And then farmers started poisoning the dogs and then wildlife got poisoned as well. So that's another kind of way of um, sort of like a, uh, sort of attacking this issue. Next. And uh, then we have from Indonesia, basically an island in Aru, uh, which the Indonesian government is trying to turn into a cattle breeding uh, center. But what's happened is what Monga Bay did was to highlight the three huge ecosystems that are actually going to be affected uh, with uh, the, the incoming uh, cattle farms, right? And then the, the areas, how large the areas are of each ecosystem, as well as, uh, you know, sago plantations, which are like traditional livelihoods that are actually going to be impacted by these farms as well. So that's affecting environmental health, yeah? Next. Uh, so uh, if you can just, um, you know, just go through these. So basically all this is predicated on good data if you can get it. So this is a story from um, my portal and this is something we did. And with the, with, with the headline, where are all the Sabah pigs? This is double-edged because for us, we couldn't get the data. We didn't know where the Sabah pigs were because the government wouldn't give us the data. So what we had to do was we had to go to an international site, the World Organization for Animal Health, OIE, for which the Malaysian government was giving data to. They wouldn't give it to a Malaysian journalist, but they gave it to them. And that's how we got the data. There's uh, more to the story, but I, I'm just gonna move on for now. So if people have questions about how to get data, um, then let, uh, I'll be very happy to cover that next. So how I want to cover now, how do you report responsibly, okay? Now the WHO has a wonderful, again, I'm just gonna go back to COVID because we've all been trained by COVID as to how to tackle infectious diseases, yeah? So WHO has this wonderful guide which has um, uh, sections on COVID-19, how to, how to cover COVID-19, how to cover vaccines, how to cover health emergencies, and how to protect yourself, uh, your own health as a journalist. Now, I want you to, I think one of the, one takeaway from this is, think of the impact your reporting will have. You read the room, understand what is going on. Is the world in panic? What's your job as a journalist if the world is in panic? How do you report responsibly? Next. Uh, and these are some of the points uh, that you, you want to be as clear and understandable and accurate as possible. You want to respect privacy. You do not want to politicize and you want to uh, ab avoid absolutes. Science is wonderful, but it can be very uncertain. And as we saw in COVID, it can keep changing, right? So what do you do, for example, if you have two research papers from very, very good sources, but they contradict each other? So here's a wonderful source, science journalists and environmental journalists. You probably already know this. It's called The Open Notebook. Um, uh, uh, you know, all the uh, links will be in my uh, presentation, which will be available to you. Go to it, and they have lots and lots of tips as to how to handle situations like that as a journalist. Now, I'm going to end with how to report safely. Now, the main takeaway from this is no story is worth sacrificing your health, not at all. 
Okay, so what you need to do is you need to assess the risks of doing the story, whether to take it on at all. And if so, how do you cover it? Can you do remote reporting? Again, COVID has taught us how to do remote reporting effectively and well. You need to follow the advice of the people who know what they're talking about. The health professionals say, don't go there, don't go there, all right? You need to draw up a plan, including an exit plan, how do you get out of the situation, and you need to stick to the plan, right? And then sanitize, sanitize, sanitize everything from your hands to your equipment, keep yourself healthy and everybody else around you, and your sources have to be kept uh, uh, safe as well, right? And finally, mental health. Again, back to, is the story really worth sacrificing your health to do? So uh, I'm just going to end here now and uh, look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Siulin. And thank you, Amy. Um, to those uh, who have joined us, we have, a, we have our team or EJN, uh, Senior Asia Manager, Amy Sim, who has been there helping us with the <laughs> backroom technology. Um, so, um, and and uh, thank you, thank you, Siulin, so much, especially for for uh, the story ideas as well as you know sharing uh, your quick takeaways. Um, as you were talking about the story ideas, I also wanted to tell everyone that you can also look for a story within a story. So whenever you are thinking into the the story, um, you know the issues. Uh, the themes that Siwin just mentioned, you can also think of a story uh, from a gender perspective. Uh, you can also think of an indigenous perspective. For example, when Serge said, you know, there's biodiversity loss, and when Ruki said, you know, this uh, infectious disease outbreaks, and uh, you know, how do, how does it all affect certain population? For example, the forest dwelling, uh, you know, people. Um, the, the, the different indigenous communities uh, or the children, you know, with the school going children, how, how do, you know, does it affect them or how does it even, you know, burden their parents, you know, uh, in, in, in the face of a growing, you know, the, uh, infectious disease outbreak, even a dengue outbreak. And, um, and then finally, uh, there's misinformation. Siulin just hinted at that. When COVID exploded, we also saw the explosion of, you know, uh, infodemic. So a lot of mis uh, misinformation or fake news also exploded. And uh, connecting to what just uh, Siulin said, no story is worth sacrificing yourself for, your health for. Um, so how do we still cover it while being safe? And uh, and this, uh, let me just remind you that, you know, if you go to the Arts Journalism Network website, the link is already shared here on the, on the chat box by my colleagues. You can also see a number of webinars that we have conducted in recent times, and you can see the recordings. You can also look at, you know, listen to so the experts, for example, the experts that are here with us today. We will be sharing the, you know, recording link uh, to this webinar, and you can identify, you can listen to them. And if you do have further questions, you can actually reach out to each each individual export, you know, so just to make sure that you are on the right side of facts and you are still getting, you know, insights even without traveling to that place in case it is way too dangerous. Um, so with that now, um, I would like to thank each of our panelists and, uh, you know, I know, Serge, uh, you have been answering some questions, but uh, yeah, we do have some very interesting questions. So for the benefit of everyone else, maybe uh, we could also answer some of them uh, right now live. So uh, the first one I see is um, from an attendant who's, you know, from Saxon and um, Saxon is planning a film about vultures. And his question is, you know, what role do you think? So his plan is, uh, you know, investigating the role of 
uh, the species play in our play in our ecosystem, cleaning our countryside of carcasses, removing uh, the breeding ground for viruses, uh, etc. Uh, but they are also, you know, largely a misunderstood species. So the question, I guess, Serge, is, you know, what role do you all think, you know, storytelling has? So the question seems to be, you know, for all the um, all the panelists, uh, but I would start with Serge because you know you 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 know brought us uh, you know to the to the thinking uh, of the biodiversity issues, the losses of species, and so on. So yes, Serge, would you like to tell Saxon and all of us here, yes. you know, what role does vultures play and why is it important? You know. To yes. Thank you. Thank you, Stella, and. Uh... Thank you, Saxon, for this uh, this important. And, and and I congratulate you also to 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 go for a documentary on this, on especially on the species that are not very well, uh, uh, I would say, uh, presentation in in the public. I used to work also from some other people doing documentaries on rodents, on rats, and it was the same. So how to show these these uh, these animals could also have a very big benefit and uh, sure that uh, you can you can find uh, there's a, a lot of studies especially uh, in india that showing the decline of uh, of uh, the vulture because of poisoning so poisoning because we use pesticide we use uh, all of those things uh, have actually declined the vulture population and now we have more and more on tracks uh, reporting so no more control of the on track and this is part so the the vulture is part of this uh, what we discuss of this nature solution so vulture actually was controlling on tracks uh, the spread uh, in India so not only but they are they are part of this remove them that we lost a, a, a service providing by free for free by these uh, animals that were considered as ugly but so helpful thank you thank you Serge yeah just um I also remember an example from you mentioned in India. So in India, nearly the entire vulture population was wiped out because of uh, a painkiller that they were, you know, uh, that the cow, <laughs> yes, the cows were fed. And so it's an excellent example of, you know, how everything is linked, the, uh, the animal health and the human health, as well as human culture. I know Siulin has also reported on, you know, uh, you have done a story on how conservation of uh, seahorses uh, is linked to the culture in Malaysia. Uh, so the, we have seen an example of that when cows were fed painkillers and then they died and then vultures fed on them and then the vultures died, you know, how it affected a minority, ethnic minority in India that, you know, for whose the post-death ritual includes you know, uh, a healthy population of vultures because um, the carbs uh, is actually, you know, offered to 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 the nature. In this case, the vultures were actually needed to clean the carcasses, the the cor you know, the carbs. So when vultures died, it affected the humans, you know, as well as the livestock, um, you know. So or you know, that's a chain link of destruction uh, as well. So um, the same question. Um, you know, was I know it was asked to all the panelists. So, Ruki, do you have anything quick uh, to to add to this? Yes, uh, not in terms. Uh, just similar to the vulture story, I was thinking more on the bats, uh, especially after COVID pandemic. There was a big backlash on bats, but you know, bats. True, they are reservoirs of viruses and bacteria, but they're also essential for the ecosystem, right? They, have, they play a huge part in, in pollination. They play a huge part in keeping insects under control in the environment. So again, this is a good angle to really keep in mind that, that the animals that are reservoirs, they're not enemies. They are part of the ecosystem and they have a role. Thank you, Ruki. I think I can also see the need of telling that story of how, you know, the positive side of the bats, why do we need bats actually? Um, and also probably, you know, then investigating, you know, how to actually, you know, maintain, uh, you know, make the 
bat proofing, for example, your house and you know the, the human population. So how could you, uh, you know, maintain this safe distance between humans and also make sure that you know, the healthy coexistence you know, continues? Um, we would like to go to the second question. This one is especially for Siulin. Um, so Siulin, the question for you is. Um, uh, any tips to convince editors on reporting sensitivity of stories related to pig farms, as it also involves our photographers or video crews who might be on the ground with us? Hi, Li Wei. Thank, thank you for the question. Uh, yes, uh, this is for those who might not be aware, Malaysia is a Muslim majority country. And as such, pigs are, are, are haram, are they're not halal. And so it actually becomes quite a sensitive uh, thing to report on, which is one of the reasons actually why I, I wanted to report on it, because I'm not Muslim. Uh, and I brought along a photographer who was also not Muslim, because uh, the issue can get very clouded in terms of sensitivities. Now, how do you convince editors, uh, Li Wei? There was actually a journalist from a Malay language uh, newspaper, Sinar, who is actually Muslim, and her whole crew was actually also Muslim. And they also uh, did an expose on illegal pig farming up in the hills in Negeri Sembilan, south of Kuala Lumpur. So uh, somehow she managed to convince the editor that the story really needed to be told. And this is because, similar to the story that I did, uh, pig farms were, were contributing to, to river pollution for the downstream. And so she wanted to do a river pollution story, trace the pollution up and found uh, the pig farms. Um, and somehow, I guess, you know, uh, I think if you, if, this, if you can, if you feel in your bones that the story is really, really important and really, really needs to be told, then speak to your editor and figure out ways of doing it. Uh, hire a freelance uh, camera person or a crew, TV crew. Uh, I know this has all to do with budgets and maybe the lack of budgets, but um, figure out a way of doing it. I'll, I'll tell you a story about how we covered the, um, the pig farming story, uh, pig farming and river pollution story. African swine fever had hit Peninsula Malaysia, but had not hit Penang, which is the area that we focused on. We were terrified of accidentally walking through all the pig farms and accidentally bringing African swine, swine fever to this, this, to this place that never had it. So we didn't go into the farms. We didn't take any photographs. We had to source all the photographs from the pig farmers. We told them what angles we wanted. We told them how many uh, pictures we wanted and, and they helped us out. So I think uh, any sympathetic editor, if they realize that this story is really important, it has to be told, then I think figure out a way you know, of, of um, of, of uh, uh, getting the story done, try. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Julian. I'm sure this is going to help many others, not just in case of pig farms, but for any um, other sensitive stories that, um, yeah, or story that may be sensitive in the local context. So I'm sure this is going to help. We have a lot of questions now coming in. There's one question which is addressed to you know all the panelists, so I'm going to bring it up now. This is Yun Kian from Malaysia, Singapore. Question to all panelists. How do you think journalists and scientists or experts can work together better to not only create awareness on climate change and biodiversity loss, but also to change policies around the same? Serge, Rookie, please. Maybe I, I can start because I have the chance to work with a famous uh, journalist uh, and, um, and uh, Marie-Monique Robin. And uh, we have the chance to, I have a chance to, to help to do first a, a book and, uh, and after the, the movie, a documentary that was a big success uh, and still a big success, which is The Fabric of, uh, of Pandemic. And uh, it was now will be translated in English, so I can send you this. And it was really like this: we work uh, during the pandemic. At the beginning of the pandemic, she she found me uh, at least uh, every uh, almost uh, every four or five days uh, just to uh, to understand on how to find the way. And we discuss a lot. I put her with a lot of scientists. So I put her with my uh, with my uh, the people I know all over the world. So about. 40, 50 scientists that are really in the field of uh, biodiversity on health and how to explain by this on the dilution effect. And she built all, all of this 
about the thing, the dilution effect, how the loss of biodiversity are linked with this fabric of, uh, of pandemics. And it was really like this. And after she did the documentary, she went to several places in the world on following scientists. So following uh, one of my, my former PhD students, I'm very proud of him because now he's in Gabon and uh, he's a, he's a Gabonese scientist working on bats or so doing a bat research on the field. Some other was in Kenya, some other in, in uh, Mexico, and they come here in Southeast Asia for the Rodan. So just for me, and uh, just att attracting and putting questions, similar questions, but actually we, we realized, and I know everybody, we realized that we, 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 we replied the same things. And this was the force of the, of the movie, of the documentary. And it was really an interaction. We, we went together. I was very, very proud and very happy to, to, work, uh, to work with this. And now I want to continue to work with journalists and documentaries. <laughs> Thank you. Um, any, any quick comment from Ruki or Sylvia? Uh, yes, actually, this is, this is a great question. And, and this is something that we are also trying to leverage at the Center for Outbreak Preparedness, but just wanted to give a small story that, that happened during um, the COVID-19 pandemic. So again, I was a scientist in the lab that I, I did not interact with journalists in a big way, but when we were developing a COVID-19 vaccine, you know, Channel News Asia came to us and wanted to make a documentary where they wanted to document the whole process of the development. And I can tell you, they followed us for days with cameras and whatnot. And we had tons of discussions. So it was really not just the journalists learning from us about the process. We learned, for, I learned a lot from the journalists in how to convey the information. And, you know, sometimes it would take several takes and they would, first they would ask me, okay, what do you want to say? What exactly? And they would clarify the meaning. And then they would take several takes. They would say, can you simplify that a little bit, but retain the, you know, the true meaning. And I think that relationship between journalists and experts and scientists that has improved during COVID-19. I see a, a, definitely on the scientist side, I see a lot of scientists that are better at communicating. And you know, some of that is because the journalists have helped us. And the reason this documentary was done, one of the reasons is obvious, obviously to document the whole process. But at the same time, it was released around the time in Singapore when the vaccine, COVID-19 vaccines became available to the wider population in an effort to educate the wider population as to how a vaccine was developed. And the hope is once you understand something, you're more likely to take it. It's not a mystery anymore. And you know, this was one of the ways I think it helped the policy, national policies for sure. Again, moving forward, that's that's one of the things that we are trying to do at the Center of Outbreak Preparedness and hopefully many academic institutions and experts do is work with journalists closely so that the findings can really be, you know, expressed both to the audience, but also at the national level. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Thank you. So if I hear you both correctly, you know, constant better air communication you know, and collaboration. See you in your quick takeaway before we... <laughs> we yeah, yeah just, just very quickly, keep yeah. doing what you guys are doing. Scientists have to reach out to journalists as well because they have no clue. They, they might have no idea. You look at how PR companies work. They're bombarding us with press releases all the time and it's all useless, always just on a new product or whatever. I'm not interested in that sort of thing. But if, you, so you have to, you know, I'm sorry, but please do reach out to journalists as well. You've made friends with the CNA people, Channel News Asia people. You've made friends, Serge, with your documentary maker, keep in touch, keep selling them stories, you know, because if they can create something beautiful, win an award together with you, then they're going to keep coming back for more. And the other uh, important thing is to communicate simply, just the same thing that I said for journalists to please try and do, be simply, you know, keep it sim accurate, but simplify it so that it's understandable, you know, and help them help you and help the world, I guess. Thank you. Thank you, Siulin. That's that's important to remember, you know, like keep reaching out to journalists and journalists, you keep, you know, your communication, you know, uh, you know, communicating with journalists. Um, uh, we, we, we just mentioned misinformation and, you know, uh, news, fake news, uh, you know, true, false. Uh, we have a question that kind of relates to that. 
And I would like you, Sergio or Ruki, to quickly answer this one. You know, this is a journalist from Western Kenya, and he says that all my life I have heard that rabies in dogs is active until it bites a human being. So it means until a dog bites a human being, then it starts ailing from rabies. True or false? It's false, <laughs> actually, yes. the, the, the virus, exactly. Okay. The virus is active, is there. Actually, the, when you are biting, you have a big chance to, uh, to get the virus because the virus is really uh, on the saliva uh, a lot, on the saliva of the dogs. Even also the, the cat, and huh? some other carnivores can be also, uh, uh, but it's more rare, but uh, the dog, so no. You, if you are bite, bitten by a dog, go to a vaccination. Don't hesitate, vaccination. Because if the, the rab is starting, it's finished. We cannot do nothing. Huh? So the, when the disease is starting, so you're biting by dogs, even we don't know if you're rabid or not, go to a, a rabid uh, vaccine shot. Important. Save Thank your you. life. <laughs> Thank you, Serge. I think that the person was also wondering, you know, earlier, Ruki mentioned bats, you know. So is our dogs a natural reservoir for, for rabies? Um, or does it occur, do they get sick only when they bite humans? Yeah. Ruki, would you uh, uh, just, like to quickly uh, comment? Right. Uh, so, so just wanted to add, right, that question. Um, so I'm from Sri Lanka and where I'm from, actually dogs, they're, they're killed only after their bite because apparently some a similar sense as that again it's it's important that these questions are asked because in the population there are stories assuming that at the point of biting is when the dog has rabies or goes crazy with the virus but that is not true as as, as Serge mentioned um, rabies uh, dogs are host for rabies so rabies do infect uh, dogs and you know and when they bite, it transmits. But again, it's it's nice that the journalists are asking these questions because these are legends or myths or, or misinformation that are persisting in populations. Definitely where where I'm from. So even though I I you know I laugh, I I agree that these kind of truths need to be communicated and corrected. Thank you. Thank you. We should wrapping up now, but. There is one question that I can't turn away from. So I'm just going to take, and uh, maybe it will take us another couple of minutes to answer this. This is uh, this question is from uh, Jaya Sridhar and Sridhar asked a question regarding finding, you know, ideas for evidence, uh, you know, positive evidence about innovative One Health solutions. Because there is so much of information overload today. You know, where do we find stories that are evidence-backed and they are focused on One Health solutions. I can I can give you some some sites. Yes, there is a now there is a new initiative that is the name is Panorama and Panorama give also some this kind of solutions. So I, um, I don't have the site but I, I will uh, provide the site so to to share. And this is quite 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 good. Is also is done by EcoHealth Alliance with some other uh, organization like IUCN, and they gather this kind of stories. So we have also the new uh, a new journal Cabi One Health, uh, and we have uh, Cabi One Health cases. So we also uh, promote uh, some solutions. So how it works really? Uh, so it's not really a scientific article, but it's really uh, showing cases and uh, you can contact people with, with these cases actually mm. thank you and yeah one, one of the <laughs> things i would like to add is to dr jai is if there is an area where actually there is no data because i know data in the one health space space is there isn't enough necessarily these are complex studies then highlight that it is good to highlight that so that people are aware and resources can be directed towards those questions. Thank you, Ruki, for bringing that up because um, earlier we did have one question that 
you know, uh, was it was also addressed to Siulin specifically, and it was focused on the lack of credible data. I hope that you know Siulin already mentioned some of the ideas that you know if you if you are not finding it locally, do look for the the international you know at the international level where the government may have you know provided that that data. Uh, and Ruki, thank you also for highlighting that the gap and the barrier that remains. I mean, you know, that can also be highlighted. So with that, we we are running a bit over now. And thank you so much for for um, those who stayed with us all this while. Uh, my apologies to those who may have asked us questions but could not get this answered. But as I told you right in the beginning, you know, we have these experts here, Ruklanti, D. Always, we have Search Moran, we have Siulin. You can connect them, you know, and you can get your questions, especially if you're preparing to, you know, write a report or do a story, do, do reach out to them. And if you missed a part of, you know, their presentations or some of the answers, then please, we will be sharing the link to this recording, you know, recording of this webinar and do go through that as well as our other webinars on our website. So with that, thank you very, very much, Sarge Moran. Thank you, Ruki. And thank you, Celine, for your time and for sharing your, your knowledge and your expertise with us today. Thank you very much, Stella. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you and have a good evening. Have a good those who are, who are just starting the day. Have a good day. And yeah, those in Asia, a good night, I believe. <laughs> So bye and see you soon again and stay connected with us on social media and through our website. Bye.